thank you and it's uh, it's good to see uh, friendly faces again so folks that were here for the math class um, you, you learned a little something about me but for folks who are new let me just tell you um, I, I'm an industrial hygienist I've been practicing industrial hygiene in Colorado for 27 years and industrial hygiene is the recognition evaluation anticipation and control of human health hazards and so if it's something that can harm a human then um, a legitimate industrial hygienist gets involved with it so it could be anything from um, radiation to ergonomics lasers sound in my particular case um, my, my specialty is microbiology uh, and toxicology so with regard to radiation I've taught I, I was a radiation safety officer for 16 years um, I have done radon endangerment studies in Grafenwur, Germany. I have done radiation assessments for hospitals with regard to some of their, um, their, their chemo uh, and, and radiation therapy uh, wards. Um, I have done a lot of work for Rocky Flats. I've done radiation exposure assessments for Los Alamos. Um, uh, and I taught radiation toxicology at DU as part of the master's program and lectured in toxi radiation toxicology at Red Rocks when they used to have their 40-hour OSHA program. And so this is going to be a little bit different than what maybe you were anticipating. Because I'm a scientist, I'm going to give you the science behind the scare. And I'm going to show you what, does, what do the scientists have to say and what is really going on with the radon issue. And you are the experts in the irrational side of marketing. So you can take this information, do with it whatever you want. But I'm going to give you a scientist's perspective uh, on this. I forgot my clicker, so I'm going to have to each time come up here and um, just click on a button. Um, so at the end of this chat, what we're going to do is you're going to understand what radioactive means. You're going to understand what are the different types of radiation. Understand units of measurement because if you ask probably almost every ra radon measurement guy what the units mean when he gives you a lab report from that radon test that they do, he has no idea what those units mean. When the EPA first came out with its certification process, it was pitched at a sixth grade level. And it didn't matter if you understood radiation or not, as long as you answered the questions correctly, they would be, you'd become certified. And so most of the people who are doing radon work, number one is they don't know anything about radon, they don't know anything about radiation, and they don't know what their numbers mean. But they're following the EPA protocol. That's all they have to do. They don't need to know any of the actual technical aspects of radiation. Uh, you're going to understand the known health effects associated with radon, and that part will surprise most of you. And you're going to understand the limitations of the measurements that are being performed in the real estate market. So to begin with, it's going to be a crash course. I'm going to move very, very quickly, and I'm, and I'm going to um, just kind of go take you back to both your high school chemistry and to your uh, college chemistry real quick. I'll just give you a real quick primer. And what we have to remember is, what is an atom? Everything around you, everything in this room, you included, is made of subatomic particles. And those subatomic particles come together into somewhat larger particles. Those are the atomic particles. You can think of an atom, a stylized atom, as being a central core of mass, and then you have these electrons circling around it. Atoms don't really look like that. There are no electrons circling around it, for example, in a planetary sort of system. But rather, you do have charges on the inside, inside that nucleus, the center of the nucleus, and those are protons and neutrons. And those get packed into the center, and the more protons that are packed in there, the more that nucleus wants to fall apart. So God sticks in more and more neutrons all around there to dilute that positive charge and keep everything together. Then outside of that nucleus is a cloud of electrons, and that cloud of electrons balances the positive charge on the inside. Now, Everything in nature that is either ordered or large wants to become small and disordered. So anytime you have order, what, you're tr what, what happens is this entropy is going to take over and it's going to try to take everything to its lowest level of energy. So things that are organized want to become unorganized unless that organization is actually its lowest state of energy. And atoms are no different. As the nucleus becomes larger and larger, it wants to get smaller and smaller. It does not like being large. Large is unstable. 
So what it'll do is, for larger atoms, they want to become smaller atoms. And in the case of radium or radon, the, the nucleus is so big that inside there, these subatomic particles are jostling around all the time, and they're trying to find a configuration that's more comfortable. And to do that, they have to start ejecting material. And that material that they're ejecting, in the case of radon or in the case of radium, we're going to talk about both of them, is it ejects two protons and two neutrons at a time. This is a chunk of matter. This is like a flying brick of the atomic world. This is a very large piece of subatomic material, and essentially it's so large, it's a helium atom is really what it is, just with no electrons on the outside. But it's a large piece of subatomic material that is ejected from the center of the atom at high speed. Because it is so large and so massive, Anything can stop it. It can only travel through the air a couple of inches. Your hand can stop it. A piece of paper can stop it. Um, it is so large that it, once it interacts, once it's ejected from the center, as it moves through, it starts colliding with other atoms and it starts to ionize those atoms. It, it, it creates a wake of damage as it moves through something, but it is what's called a high LET particle, a high linear energy transfer, meaning it slams into stuff. It just and it releases all that energy, and it, and it just imparts all that energy all at once. The smaller particles, on the other hand, they don't do that. They can travel. They're much smaller. They're much lighter. They can travel long distances, in some cases, infinite distances. But we're really dealing with this alpha particle. This is known as alpha radiation. And it's, you can think of it as just a chunk of matter traveling at extremely high speed. And as soon as it starts hitting something, it's going to be imparting that energy. You could think of it as, um, uh, as a speeding locomotive going through a forest of small trees. And each time it hits a tree, it is going to obliterate that tree, but that tree is going to slow that locomotive down infinitesimally. And so once it hits enough trees, it's going to stop it. But if that locomotive were to hit uh, a mountain, a granite mountain, it's going to slam into that mountain full speed and that mountain will stop it and it's going to release all that energy all at once. So that's alpha radiation. We're going to talk about why it's important in just a minute. So atoms can eject the large particles, the alpha radiation, uh, smaller particles, beta radiation. Beta radiation is not from the, typically, uh, it's, it's going to be one of the electrons. It's going to be a negatively charged particle. So that travels also at high speed, but that can travel for longer distances. That can go through us, for example, without impacting us because it travels through. It goes right through us, and if, there's, if, it, doesn't, if it doesn't interact with anything inside you, then there's no effect. Effect. It has no effect. Similarly, uh, you could have gamma radiation. Gamma radiation is a photon. It's a light wave. And it's essentially, it's an x-ray. Um, the only difference between x-rays and gamma rays is x-rays are man-made. We produce them on purpose. Whereas gamma rays, they are produced naturally. They are norms, n uh, naturally occurring radioactive materials. But essentially they're the same thing. A gamma ray and an x-ray are exactly the same thing. And depending on the energy, it can either go through you or it can interact or it can be kind of a mixture of both. That's why when we go and we get a medical x-ray, some of those x-rays are passing through us and some of those x-rays are getting stopped by something. And it's the difference between the absorption rate and what's going through you that allows us to have essentially a photograph of, of the inside of somebody. That's the whole idea behind x-rays. So once the, they're gonna keep ejecting these particles, whether it's gamma, whether it's beta, whatever it is, until the center of that nucleus once, it's, one, once it finds its stable configuration, something it likes, it's going to stop ejecting material, it's now a stable isotope. And it doesn't decay any further. Uh, uh, ejected particles interfere with radio transmissions. That's why we refer to it as radioactive. If you have an AM signal nearby, it's going to interfere with it. It's going to create its own radio signals. So we talk about it as being radioactive. Each time there is a configuration change, it's called a disintegration or a decay. Every time there's something that's ejected from the atom, it's a disintegration. These elements are all around us, and they can be radioactive or they can be stable. 
So iron, these are all very common words to you. Iron, nickel, oxygen, copper, tin, potassium, iodine, sodium, neon, mercury, uranium. All of those are very common words. You all know that you can go and you can get iodine from King Supers to put it onto a cut or a scrape. But what you may not know is there's a certain portion of that that is radioactive. If you go in, do we have, uh, is that a smoke detector? No, do we have any smoke detectors in here? Um, <laughs> smoke detectors, go home and look at your smoke detector. Inside your smoke detector is a radioactive material, a very powerful alpha emitter. It's called americium 3, 137, it's americium something or other, I can't remember, it's americium anyway. I don't remember the isotope. But it, it is highly unstable, extremely radioactive. There's a small chunk of americium in there and it is pumping out alpha particles like nobody's business. And then what it is, is there's a divider in there. Some of the alpha particles are gonna to go to a detector on one side. Some of the alpha particles are going to have an airstream moving through it and they're gonna to go to a detector on the other side. When smoke particles move up into that pathway, those alpha particles are slamming into the smoke particles and they're not making it to the detector. And when there is a sufficient difference between the reference beam and the, uh, the airstream beam, then the sensors go, whoa, man, I'm not getting as many as this guy over here. There must be smoke in the air, and the detector goes off. So we're surrounded by radiation all around us. Now, not all of those isotopes are necessarily radioactive. Many of these isotopes are quite stable. But the point here is that it's all around us. Almost all of the radon that we're dealing with in the residential radon issue comes from uh, an element known as radium. Radium is a solid and it has two properties that make it very important. The first one is it's found naturally occurring in, it's a norm, it's a naturally occurring radioactive material found in soils and it is highly water soluble. It likes to get into water, it likes to stay in water. But once it goes through the first decay and it pumps out a disintegration, it turns into radon. So it becomes a new element. Now is when the problems begin because radon is neither a solid, it is a gas, and it has what's called a high Henry's constant, which means it does not want to be in water. It wants to get out of water very badly, and it will get out of water if you give it any kind of an opportunity. So if you have a, a stream, an underground stream, that's running through a radium-rich soil, it's dissolving all that radium. That radium is going into that water, and now it goes through a decay and it becomes radon, and it does not want to be in the water, so it's going to enter the, enter the soil gas, and that's when the problems begin, because now it's mobile. It is very mobile, it's going to move into properties, it's going to move into the general air. The air we're breathing right now contains radon. It's just moving into the air, and now is when the problems begin, because it's not the radon. Radon is toxicologically inert. Radon is one hundred percent safe because radon cannot interact with the human body in any way. Radon is what's known as a noble gas. A noble gas is a gas that will not react with any other material. So for a start, radon is not the issue. Radon, you could breathe an atmosphere of 80% radon as long as there was about 20% oxygen in there and then a smattering of CO2 to take care of blood chemistry. But radon itself is completely 100% biologically inert. So why is there an issue? It's because it's not the radon, but rather it's the next four elements that occur in very rapid succession. These are called the short-lived radon daughters. They are what are the problem. So you have radon, completely biologically inert radon, you've breathed it into your lungs, and now suddenly one of those atoms starts to go through its rapid de decay change, and it's going to convert into, into different uh, compounds very quickly. The first one, with a half-life of only three minutes, is polonium, 27 minutes, lead 214, goes through a beta decay, bismuth, lives a half-life of 20 minutes, and then almost instantly we go back to polonium-214, and then that decays, and that goes to stable lead, which again is a solid. So it's these yellow guys here that are the problem. These are the short-lived radon daughters known as the radon progeny. It's not the radon. Radon cannot hurt you in any way. 
Once the decay starts to happen, however, these are the ones that create the problem. It's the radon progeny that are toxicologically significant. So right away you start going, well, okay, so it's not radon. So, so where's all this coming from? So now let's talk about the, the units of measurement. Curies, when you go and you get a report from a, from a radon guy for a house, he's gonna give you a report and it says that there was seven pica curies per liter. What, what does that even mean? What Madame Curie figured out was that if you have one gram of radium, exactly one gram of radium, that it will start decaying, and it will start decaying at 37 billion disintegrations per second. And then as time goes on, that number decreases, 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 decreases until you wait long enough, and now maybe there's only a thousand disintegrations per second. It's because the radium is decaying. It's turning into other things. It's starting to decay and it's no longer going through the, the disintegration process. So Madame Curie needed a, um, a method of measuring this and that unit became the Curie, known as a Curie. And that a Curie is 37 billion disintegrations per second. Um, now we, we don't, we'll talk about this as scientists, we don't use uh, curies. That's really only used, that, that's kind of a little archaic, like, like me, a little archaic. Now, importantly, curies do not measure concentration. And I'll talk about that in just a second. They are not units of concentration. And, but if you ask a radon guy, he'll tell you, that tells you how much radon is there. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Completely wrong. We use what's called a becquerel. And a becquerel is a much easier unit to handle. It's just one disintegration per second. Okay, so it's one, one, something happens every second within that nucleus. So, curies do not measure concentration. If you had a house with four pica curies per liter, and you had a house with eight pica curies per liter, there could be more radon in the house with four pica curies per liter than in the house with eight pica curies per liter. People think that the higher the pica curies per liter, the more radon I have. No. It's not true. It's, it just is not the case. And that's because pica curies per liter are not units of concentration. If I have a teaspoon of salt and I put a teaspoon of salt into a gallon of water, I have one teaspoon per gallon. That's a concentration. It's a mass per unit. Okay? If I have parts per million, parts per million that's a concentration. I have a known amount to a known amount. If I, if I say this room contains about 20% oxygen, well, what I'm saying is that there are about 20 units of oxygen for every 80 units of something else. That's a concentration. Pica curies per liter are units of activity. They are not units of concentration. If I had a house with one pica curie per liter and I had a house with ten pica curies per liter, I could very easily have more radon in the house with one pica curie per liter than I have with ten pica curies per liter because it's not a unit of concentration. Pica curies per liter do not tell you anything about how much radon is in the house. It only tells you that they are looking at a specific portion of the short-lived radon daughters. And they're measuring that, and it's usually the bismuth that they're looking at, but not always. So for a start, these radon measurements, they're not even measuring radon. There's not a single radon guy out there measuring radon. Now he doesn't know that. He's probably measuring bismuth. And that's why you can have two houses, one with one pica curie per liter and one with ten pica curies per liter, and the house with one has more radon in it than the house with ten pica curies per liter. It's because the guy's not even measuring radon. He's measuring bismuth as a general rule. Uh, not always, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. So, pica curies per liter are not units of concentration, and therefore, from that, you cannot determine dose. Using those units does not tell a toxicologist anything about the dose received in that house because it is not a concentration. Therefore, if we do not know what the dose is, we cannot speak to the issue of harm and we cannot speak to the issue of risk. So a house with 10 pica curies per liter 
may be less risky than a house with one pica carry per liter. Okay? So what I'm instilling in you is this. Don't think that pica carries per liter tell you anything about the radon in the house, because it doesn't. And it was never intended to. Now, once we start getting into units, as you can imagine, if somebody were to try to deal with, um, you know, we, we're, we've got a unit of a Curie at 37 billion disintegrations per second, that's, those are too many zeros. We don't like zeros. Scientists like to you talk in round numbers. We don't like too many zeros on either side of the, the decimal place. So, so in our normal life, we typically are going to deal with things like inches, feet, miles. We would, not, we would not use, for example, miles to express an inch and say, oh, that, that's one sixty-three thousandth of a mile. No, we talk about a mile, two miles, three miles, two feet, three feet, four feet, five inches, two yards. We want to use units that, have, that, that allow us to use whole numbers, not, not decimals. We don't like decimals. And so the same thing in science. What we do is we break down numbers, either making them larger or making them smaller, so we can continue to use whole numbers. So in the case of distance, for example, we have a meter. And if we have a thousand meters, we call it a kilometer. If we have, uh, if we have uh, a hundredth of a meter, we talk, we talk about a centimeter, a millimeter, a micrometer, a nanometer. We, we, we keep changing the prefix, but the unit remains a meter. And then we start talking about, is it a big meter? Or do we have lots of them, like a kilometer or a megameter? Or we do, do we have tiny amounts of a meter, a millimeter, a centimeter, a micrometer, or a micron? And so it is also with units of, of uh, radiation. When we talk about a Curie, we already know that a Curie is 37 billion disintegrations per second. And then we start saying, that's too big. It's just, just way too many zeros. So we start talking about centicuries, millicuries, microcuries, nanocuries, and picocuries. And essentially, that would be, for a centi, it's one one hundredth. For a milli, you're saying one thousandth of something. A micro is one millionth. A nano is one e minus nine. And then a pico is one e minus 12. So it's one with 12 zeros after it. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny amount. So when you hear of a pico curie, it is one ten billionth of a curie. One e minus 12. Now, what does it mean? So somebody says, well, you know, it's above four picocuries per liter. My house is below four picocuries per, per liter. We have to remember that, that the EPA suggested limit carries no weight of law. It is not a regulation. It is not a standard. It is a nothing. It is the EPA suggests that you have no more than four picocuries per liter in a house. They have no statutory authority to enforce it anywhere in the country. It's a suggestion. It's just like your neighbor comes over and says, you know what, I, I suggest that your, your well should run at a certain amount. Well, thank you, Joe, I appreciate it. What if it's not that amount? Who cares? Okay, so there is no standard at four picocuries per liter. That's an EPA suggested recommendation. Now consider the following. The OSHA, the Department of Labor, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, they do have standards. Those are enforceable standards. Uh, those carry weight of law. And in the United States, the permissible exposure limit currently in the United States for workers is 100 picocuries per liter. Now, by the way, this picocuries per liter is a very different picocuries per liter than in the residential market. When you get that little thing back, that lab report back, the units that they're using on, in, when you see a residential setting um, report, the picocuries per liter that they're using are not real picocuries per liter. Those are US EPA invented picocuries per liter that have no translation to real picocuries per liter. And, and the reason for it is a little complicated. I'm not going to go into it. You can go to my website and read why that's the case. So when you get the lab report back, it's not a real picocuries per liter. Okay. But according to OSHA, American workers can be exposed up to 100 picocuries per liter. Those are the real picocuries per liter. They're actually calculated as actual picocuries per liter. 
Um, for example, uh, nuclear workers, they are allowed from norms what's called one annual limit of intake, one ALI, an annual limit of intake. And that's going to be from all of the norms, all of the naturally occurring radioactive materials around them. And one ALI would be equivalent to 2,000 hours at 30 picocuries per liter. That is what's known as the derived air concentration for radon. I don't expect you to understand any of this. You'll get little tiny bits and pieces like the top of, a, of an iceberg. Um, but uh, Michelle's going to have this presentation. You can always go back to it again. So now let's put those kind of activities into perspective. Remember, we're worried about four picocuries per liter, right? Bananas weigh in at about 40,000 picocuries per gram, which would be about 80,000 picocuries per liter for a banana. Okay, 80,000 picocuries per liter. Milk comes in at about 800 to 1200 picocuries per liter, about 11,000 picocuries per kilogram. Wine, about 400 to 800 picocuries per liter. We are surrounded by radiation. Everything about you right now, you are swimming in radioactive uh, emanations. Can everybody read that? Is that too small? I'd like you to read that. Okay. So, just reading that sentence, you've gone, your body alone has gone through about 119,000 picocuries, about 4,400 picocuries every second. That's you. You are irradiating you. You are irradiating the person next to you. That person is irradiating you. And every one of those disintegrations is occurring within your body next to cells. So why aren't we all dead from cancer by the age of two? Okay, remember, we're worried about four picocuries per liter. So where does that number come from? So you are walking radioactive people. One of the, one of the funnest assessments I did was a, um, a cancer hospital was doing radiotherapy, and so they were injecting people with technetium. And those people were, they were like walking nuclear facilities. They, they actually had to segregate them uh, so that somebody in the elevator didn't get next to them and irradiate them. Uh, th these people were walking around, they were so highly radioactive. But even you are radioactive. So why, why aren't we all dead? We aren't dead because there's a paradigm in toxicology that's called the wisdom of Paracelsus. Paracelsus was an ancient uh, physician who figured out that there was no substance that was so dangerous, so toxic, that if you didn't subdivide it into a small enough dose, that it, it could be rendered harmless. And there was nothing that was so harmless that if you didn't consume a large enough amount of it, that it wouldn't kill you. So, for example, water, just regular old water, if you drink too much water, believe it or not, it can kill you. Especially if it's pure water. There, there was a case in the 80s here in Colorado um, that made medical history because she drank distilled water, not knowing that distilled water is very toxic. Distilled water is very, water is, well, oxygen is toxic. Here we are with 20% oxygen in this room. And if we decrease that oxygen, we will die. If we increase that oxygen past about 22%, we'll go blind, and up to about 23, 24%, it'll kill us. We live in a very narrow window of acceptable oxygen. So what makes something a poison is not its inherent ability to cause harm, but the dose that is received. So if I take table salt, I need a certain amount of salt in my diet, but if I consume too much, I'll get sick. Vitamin C, too little I get scurvy, too much, and it can actually kill me. So this is called homeostasis. Our body's in a state of homeostasis. We're, we're, we're doing this balancing act constantly between too little and not surviving or thriving and too much, which would be toxicologically significant. 
So the dose makes the poison. So then that, then that takes us into what, what are the terms then that we're using? If anything can be a poison and nothing might be a poison, it's only dose related, then what kind of terms are we starting to use? The first one is going to be hazard. A hazard is something that is intrinsically capable of producing harm. That would be a hazardous material. Risk is the probability that that harm is going to be realized. So let's say, for example, if I had a, a cylinder of the gas that was used in the gas chambers, I've got a cylinder of hydrogen cyanide. That's a hazardous material. Hydrogen cyanide.